Many years ago, when I was a young Christian, I used to visit bookshops, particularly on Saturdays,、uh, and I used to look for academic works that would help me understand the Christian faith, the truths of the Bible. But there was always one book which I saw at the corner of my eye, which I really didn't want to look at, I didn't want to read, and I never bought it at that time. It's this book, the orthodox corruption of Scripture, the effect of early Christological controversies on the text of the New Testament, by Professor Bart D. Ehrman. Now, obviously, I did buy this book, and I have since、uh, read it, and I do recommend it. But it does contain some very disturbing material,、uh, particularly if you're a conservative Christian, as I as I was. Bart Ehrman is well known as、uh, probably the world's leading textual critic. He is an expert on the early Greek manuscripts of the New Testament,、um, and he has written a great deal about this. This book is、uh, a scholarly work written by a scholar for other scholars, but we as lay people can read it and appreciate and enjoy the fruits of his labours nonetheless. Although it is written at a very high level, and I do recommend it. As I say, on the back there's a number of、uh, academic Reviews、um, praising it、uh, for its excellence in terms of its scholarship. So I just want to share with you the opening words of his book, and then we're going to look at one particular example of、uh, Christian scribal corruption of the New Testament. This example is not the most famous one. There are very juicy ones out there. If you want to look at, say, the Trinity verse that was inserted into the New. Testament. That's much more spectacular, but this one is still very significant and is often、uh, not appreciated. And Christians still use it today to prove、uh, their doctrines. So we'll look at that as well. So Bart Ehrman, in his introductory chapter、uh, entitled "The Text of Scripture in an Age of Dissent: Early Christian Struggles for Orthodoxy," he explains,、uh, basically setting out the position in his book. Uh, and what he intends to argue, he says, Christianity in the second and third centuries was in a remarkable state of flux. To be sure, at no point in its history has the religion constituted a monolith. But the diverse manifestations of its first three hundred years, whether in terms of social structures, religious practices, or ideologies, have never been replicated. Nowhere is this seen more clearly than in the realm of theology. In the second and third centuries, there were, of course, Christians who believed in only one God. Others, however, claimed that there were two gods. Yet others subscribed to thirty or three hundred and sixty-five or more. Some Christians accepted the Hebrew Scriptures as a revelation of the one true God, the sacred possession of all believers. Others claimed that the scripture, scriptures had been inspired by an evil deity. Some Christians believed that God had created the world and was soon going to redeem it. Others said that God neither had created the world nor had ever had any dealings with it. Some Christians believed that Christ was somehow both a man and God. Others said that he was a man but not God. Others claimed that he was God, but not a man. Others insisted he was a man who had been temporarily inhabited by God. Some Christians believed that Christ's death had brought about the salvation of the world. Others claimed that his death had no bearing on salvation. Yet others alleged that he had never even died. It's interesting that. Few of these variant theologies went uncontested, and the controversies that ensued impacted the surviving literature on virtually every level. The one level I will be concerned with in the present study, in other words, his book here, involves the manuscripts of the evolving Christian scriptures. What would eventually be called the New Testament? Because, by the way, me speaking now, these letters, for example, and the Gospels and so on, weren't originally considered to be Scripture. They weren't seen as inspired by God at the beginning. Only much later did they become to be believed to be somehow revelatory and came to be included in this canon called the New Testament. And that was centuries after Jesus. The New Testament manuscripts were not produced 
by impersonally were not produced impersonally by machines capable of flawless reproduction they were copied by hand by living breathing human beings who were deeply rooted in the conditions and controversies of their day did the scriptures polemical context influence the way they transcribed their sacred scriptures the burden of the present study is that they did that theological disputes specifically disputes over christology christology by the way is the study of the nature of jesus who was he you know, was he man was he god was he both or whatever so these disputes he argues prompted christian scribes to alter the words of scripture in order to make them serviceable for the polemical task scribes modified their manuscripts to make them more patently orthodox and less susceptible to abuse by the opponents of orthodoxy wow you can see why i didn't want to read this all those years ago uh, what christian would ever want to read anything like this it's just it's just too toxic it's too explosive that christian scribes altered the words of scripture in order to make them more serviceable for their polemical tasks for their you know their apologetic activity um so that's quite extraordinary and um just to share with you the chapter headings of uh, this book by Bart Ehrman. So we've already mentioned the chapter heading of the first chapter. Then he goes on to look at anti-adoptionistic corruptions of Scripture. So in other words, well, where there are um, apparently tendencies in the New Testament to say that Jesus wasn't God, that he was somehow adopted to be God's son, uh, that was changed by some scribes to do away with that heresy there are anti-separationalist corruptions of scripture chapter three chapter four has anti-docetic corruptions of scripture chapter five anti-patria passionist corruptions of scripture six the orthodox corruptors of scripture now i'm not going to go into what these terms mean they're technical terms to do with the way jesus was seen and understood uh, in relationship to the father and who died on the cross but basically different scribes different times all trying to correct the bible to make sure it conforms with their beliefs okay so uh that's particularly interesting now the example um that uh i wanted to share with you is a text found in the king james version or in the new king james version this is uh my copy of the new king james very swanky cover there and quite a well-known verse in 1 timothy chapter 3 verse 16 it reads in the king james and the new king james version exactly the same in both great is the mystery of godliness god was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirit seen by angels preached among the gentiles believed on in the world received up in glory so that's 316 in the first letter of timothy the first sentence there god was manifest in the flesh now if you go to speaker's corner as i do occasionally you will see christians missionaries holding up banners uh saying just that god was manifest in the flesh and this proves obviously the apostle paul thought that you know god had become a man so it's it's quite serious so what does bart ehrman say about this is this an example of corruption is this a a verse that was uh inserted later by christian scribes well he says on page 78 of his book um, he's going to use a word theos theos is a greek word uh for god and in the greek new testament uh whenever god is referred to um, it means theos god so he says that the reading theos cannot be original is shown both by the character of the manuscript attestation so he's basically saying it's not in the earliest uh and best manuscripts and then he gives the reasons uh why he, technical reasons why that is the case and then he concludes the change to the manuscript must have been made fairly early at least during the third century given its widespread attestation from the fourth century onwards it can therefore best be explained as an anti-adoptionistic corruption that stresses the deity of christ 
So he's basically saying there <clears throat> that it wasn't there in the early manuscripts. It was added uh, several centuries after Christ to emphasize the deity of Jesus. And that's a very important doctrine for some people in the early church. Not all Christians, of course, believe that Jesus uh, was divine at all. Um, I mean, just to conclude, my own particular favorite example, if it's uh, if I can use the word favorite, but the most glaring and the most egregious example of um, one scribe or Christian changing the words of Jesus is actually in the New Testament itself, by which I mean Matthew, the author of the Gospel of Matthew. He's actually anonymous. We don't know who Matthew is. Doesn't say it's by Matthew in the text. He changed the words of Jesus in Mark, the Gospel of Mark, because he used the Gospel of Mark, basically all of it, edited it, changed it, lead out, left out bits and pieces and changed the words of Jesus at crucial times. And this tells us really what Matthew's agenda is. In Mark, the earlier gospel, Jesus denies he is God in Mark chapter 10, verse, verses 17 to 18. And Matthew, who copied Mark, that's the standard understanding in academia, uh, basically changes the words of Jesus to remove the embarrassment of Jesus as denying his divinity and to ensure that uh, the new Jesus, Matthew's created Jesus, conforms with the views that he held towards the end of the first century. Um, now, you can do this yourself, but there's one problem. And sometimes when Christians do this, and I ask them to do it, they look at the King James Version. But the King James Version is the one translation that keeps, that makes the words in both Gospels the same in Matthew and Mark. If you look at any other modern translation, like the NRSV, my favourite, which is the gold standard in uh, English translations in academia, you will clearly see, which is an excellent translation of the Greek, that in the earlier text of Mark, Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's no one good but God alone. In Matthew's version, Jesus' words have been changed and he says, why do you ask me about what is good? There is no one good but God alone. And Professor John Barton, Professor of Holy Scripture at the University of Oxford, that's his title, um, on blogging theology, you can see the video, said to me, without any prompting for me, that Matthew had been dishonest, is his word, uh, in changing the words of Jesus to remove this problem. So the point of me mentioning, it's not just that later scribes changed the scriptures, but even within the what became the New Testament, you had individual writers copying other writers and changing their words to suit their polemical or apologetic or Christological views later on. So it's even happening within the Bible itself. Now, this may sound alarmist and so on, but th these are cold, hard facts, unfortunately. I wish they weren't so. I, I'm, I, I, it's horrible to have to, you know, share this information in a way, but I, I want to raise the bar when it comes to knowledge of what's really going on with the manuscripts and this book the orthodox corruption of scripture um, really goes through many many examples of how later christian scribes have altered and changed uh the text and this resonates particularly with muslims i think with the idea of textual corruption as a theme in the quran of course and it accuses the uh, the people of the book jews and christians of altering changing misinterpreting and textually corrupting their scriptures for their own purposes so the quran is actually very critical of this practice uh, and highlights it in its polemical engagement with aspects of christian practice and christian belief so there we are i hope that was of interest till next time